Welcome to lecture 3H, case study on GPU architectures. We have already learned about the background of graphics processing units or GPUs, its internal understanding and what are the ways in which a program is being transformed into a vector code that can be run on a GPU machine. Today we will learn about some architectural features as well as some case studies based upon our basic understanding on the architecture of the GPU. Just a quick recap, we learned already about the difference between CPUs which consists of few out of order cores that you see and how it is differ from a GPU which has hundreds to thousands of cores having its own memory and small control unit which are connected to a RAM. So, in short GPU is many in order fine grained multi-threaded cores whereas your CPU consists of few out of order super scalar processors. Let us now try to understand what is the interaction between a GPU and a CPU. So, if you look at this code that we discussed in the last video where two matrix elements, element of A matrix is added with element of B matrix to produce the result in C. So, we have CPU cores and we have GPU cores like what you told we have 1 or 2 CPU cores and then we have hundreds of GPU cores that is been available. Initially the program is starting from the CPU memory where the matrix value is stored there in the CPU's memory and then there is a process by which you transfer the relevant matrix into the GPU's memory and then the GPU cores will take the appropriate data. We will see this in today's case study. You perform the task that is what it has been happening inside GPU and then you store the result back. So, in short we have the first step is known as CPU GPU data transfer. The data that is available in the memory of the CPU is transferred to the GPU and then the execution of the thread happens in various GPU cores in parallel because already the data is been there. So, some of the elements of A and the corresponding elements of B are being processed by a thread T1. So, it data would be moving from the GPU's memory into the appropriate cores. Then something else will be processed by thread 2. So, that data will be going into only that course that is what we are going to see and once the result is been ready from the GPU CPU data transfer take place. Now, let us try to understand how things work here. So, if you look at the CPU GPU interaction, we told that there are some portion in your line where the sequential or modestly parallel sections are going to be running on the CPU cores that is what you are seeing this is called the sequential threads. Whereas, there can be some massively parallel sections of code that is available wherein may we make use of the GPU's help. So, in short when you start with the program you start the execution in the CPU there are some statements which have to be executed in a sequential fashion or very limited amount of parallelism is available wherein copying into GPU and carrying out things into GPU may not be the most feasible idea. So, in this case a sequential thread will run in the CPUs and then when you have a data, a parallel data that has been available which can be executed by multiple parallel GPU threads, then you copy the data from CPU into the GPU and then carry out it. This is exactly what is being shown by the parallel. So, these two portions are being running in the GPU and whereas, these two portions are going to be run in the CPU. Now, if you look into the interaction what happens inside the GPU kernel, the GPU works on a bulk synchronous programming model wherein we use global synchronization between kernels, but we are actually going for a coarse grained approach there. The host CPU allocates memory, copies data and then launches the kernel. So, once the data is ready in the appropriate GPU kernel, then the threads are being launched. The device, so the terminology host means CPU in this context and the device means GPU in the context. The device GPU execute these kernels. If you look at the broader organization of GPU, it consists of grids. Grids internally are composed of multiple blocks, blocks are nothing but work groups. But within a block, we can have shared memory and we can ensure synchronization also. And then block consists of multiple threads. So, thread is the basic work item that we are going to talk here. Now, let us see the GPU execute kernels. 
and we know that the kernels consist of grids and each grid consists of multiple blocks and there are multiple threads that are being assigned inside a block. Now, when you look from the hardware perspective, the hardware is free to schedule the thread blocks. So, consider the case of a grid. We already see in that a grid consists of multiple blocks. So, here we are talking about a grid that has 8 blocks inside it, which are named as block 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., up to 7. Now, if you look at a device which is of this architecture, then what I am going to do is I am going to have my threads organized like this. Your block level organization is going to be in this form in the device or I can have in this time also. So, this will take more time whereas, since you have more parallel number of blocks that can be scheduled on the device, it is a device property. How many parallel processing units you are here? So, if you have 4 parallel units of processing, then I can schedule the blocks like this whereas, in this case I have only 2 parallel processing units. So, it is when you have more number of units that is available in the hardware, even though your kernel grid consists of 8 blocks, it can be ordered as 4 into 2 or it can be ordered as 2 into 4 as well. So, the basic difference is in the total execution time. So, less number of resources, you will take more time, whereas if you have more number of resources, you are going to take less time. So, this is what is told, hardware is free to schedule the thread blocks depending upon the availability of the hardware units. So, each block can execute in any order related to the. So, there can be some blocks that is going to be running in this order, it can have an alternate mapping also that is been prescribed here. Now, consider the case that we have already seen this. Now, let us look into what is the memory hierarchy inside the CPU. So, we talk about a kernel grid and the grid consists of blocks and inside the blocks you have the threads. So, look at this structure, you have a grid that is inside your device and then you have block 0 0 and block 1 0 like that many blocks are there. Now, the thread is located inside a block. So, this is your thread, thread 0 0 and thread 1 0. This is thread 0 0 and thread 1 0 of the second block. So, there are two blocks that you are talking. Every thread has access to its own registers. So, whatever that you do, you make use of these registers for your intermediate calculations and then that is how you generate the results. Now, if threads wanted to have, they have a shared memory. That means, threads inside a block have a shared memory and then similarly, these two threads which are part of the second block or block 1 0, they have their own private registers and they have their own shared memory. If the threads wanted to produce one result, one thread is uh, going or they both are going to operate upon the same data, then the shared memory is going to help us in this way. Now, coming to we have other two things, one is known as each of this thread can take data from a constant memory. So, this is something wherein you have a data that has to be pumped into all the blocks together. So, that is called a constant memory and then you have a global texture and surface memory that is been available. So, these two memories are outside the shared memory concept that we are talking. Shared memory is the memory which can be accessed only by the threads under the same block whereas, these are the places where the data is being kept which need to be given to all the blocks. So, in short this host which is your CPU will pump in your data into the constant memory and from the constant memory this data get moved into the appropriate shared memory depending upon what is the data that each of these individual threads are going to use. So, based upon block wise organization and based upon the thread wise subdivision inside a block we need to take a call where the data has to be kept. So, in this way we learned about the hierarchy of the memory architecture inside the GPU. So, one thing that we have to understand from this is when you move your data from the CPU to the GPU memory, it is not like a one chunk of memory where we are going to operate. As we have seen the grid level division, after that there is a block level division and then there is a further thread level division. Sometimes the thread may operate on some data. then if two threads belonging to the same block is there, it has to be kept in the shared memory of the block. But if there are two threads which are outside a same block, then if they are going to operate upon some, some data, then that has to be kept into the constant memory. In this way, depending upon the requirement, depending upon the data that has to be shared, there need to be having appropriate control mechanism which moves the data from across these memory hierarchies. 
Now let us talk about CUDA. CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. It was proposed by NVIDIA. It is a parallel computing platform and programming model developed by NVIDIA for general computing on GPU. CUDA is also can be considered as a software layer that gives direct access to the GPU's virtual instruction set and parallel computation elements for the execution of this compute kernels. Let us see try to understand how things happening with the help of uh, this CUDA. So, CUDA is nothing but a programming model that has been prescribed by NVIDIA in order to work with GPUs. So, let us try to understand the processing flow. The processing flow generally consists of first you allocate a memory inside your GPU and then there is a memory copy. Your input data is been pushed into this memory and then you have to configure the setup. How many number of grids are there and how many number of blocks are there and how many number of threads are there. This is called the execution configuration setup. Once it is ready, so in terms of blocks and threads you have how to give the description. And next we are going to talk about kernel call for execution. Once things are set up, then we are going to trigger the execution. The execution starts, the result is produced. Again we have a memory copy. So, this time it is from GPU memory into the CPU memory and then you deallocate memory and then you repeat the process for the subsequent data that has been available. The whole operations can be organized like this, copy processing data from the main memory that is from the CPU into the GPU that is text number 1. Now second is your CPU will instruct the GPU to carry out the task that is exactly what is happening in these two steps, keeping the configuration ready and triggering the operation. So, and that will re result in step number 3, execute parallel things on each of the core. Now, the result has been ready. Once the result is ready, the result will come back into the GPU memory and from there you copy the result that is what exactly that has been shown. So, in this case we are using a specific GPU GeForce 8800. So, more or less the structure is same across the other GPUs as well. And let us now try to see that when it comes to memory access, GPU works on parallel data and data is going to be stored in arrays. So, when it comes to memory access, how indexing that is going to happen, in what way this thread concept, the block concept is going to help us. So, images typically one of the most common data and even videos are also stored in terms of sequence of images. So, images are two dimensional data structures which consist of a height and a width and they are typically stored in array. So, if you represent an image by image j i, where the height is defined by the component j and the width is going to be defined by the component i. So, consider the case of you have an image like this, which has 8 rows and 8 columns and then you are going to talk about an image of 0 1. So, this is the particular pixel that I am going to talk about image of 0 1. So, it is in the 0th row and then the first column. Image of 1 2, it is in the first row and in the second column. Like that I will be able to represent. But in a raw major format, the whole data is going to be represented sequentially inside your memory. The same image whatever that you see here, this is the shaded portion that you see. So, the same image when you are going to be storing sequentially inside memory, then it will be stored like this. Now, from this how are you going to access it? This is called a stride, typically the stride that we are talking. In this case, stride is going to be 8 and I am talking to Tom about image of 0 1. Image of 0 1 is given by how do you going to access it? 0 into 8 plus 1 that is the location. Whereas, your image of 1 2 this is the location. So, the image of 0 1 is this and image of 1 2 is and image of 1 2 is defined as image of 1 into 8 plus 2. So, this into the stride and plus this is going to be the offset that is going to be there. So, a two dimensional image now you are going to access in terms of a one dimensional format. Now, coming into one dimensional grid structure let us try to see how it is been done. So, as per convention generally we use one GPU thread in order to compute the value of a pixel and the grid of blocks of threads. So, what you do is you have four parameters that you define the grid dimension, the block dimension, the block ID and the thread ID. Since it is one dimension, everything is having only x coordinate. Let us repeat grid dimension, block dimension, block ID and the thread ID, four components that you are going to specify. So, for the same image what you see here, let us divide, let us say this is going to be my block 0, then block 1, 
this is block 1, block 2, block 3 like that. I am going to have a sequence of blocks that is been available. So, this is the block that I am going to talk about and each of them is an individual pixel. The pixel computation is being carried out by threads. So, I have 4 threads in this block. So, first you have to understand you have a grid grid consists of many blocks. Thus we can see that what are the blocks that is been available. Each block consists of many threads. In this case, each block has 4 data item for a circumpolar pixel. Each of the pixel is going to be processed by an individual thread that is there. Since we are more modern about the block ID and the thread ID concept that is there, block ID into block dimension plus the thread ID that is going to give you the access to it. So, if this is the element that I am going to talk about, so, it is block 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. That is why it is called block 6. So, how do you compute? Block ID that is 6 into block dimension. Each block has 4 elements. So, that is called 6 into 4 and then what is the thread ID within that? This is handled by thread number 1. The second element here is handled by thread number 1. So, 6 into 4, 24 plus 1, 25th. So, the 25th element in the array is what I am going to talk about here. Now, let us consider the same thing into a two dimensional approach. So, here you, you have a grid dimension x and y that is going to be there. So, your block 0, 0 is defined like this and then we have the remaining blocks also. So, each of the block consists of an x and y because it is a two dimensional grid that I am going to talk about. So, this is called block id where y equal to 1. So, this is 0, 1, 2 and 3. So, the block id x equal to 2 and block id of y equal to 1 that is what this particular array all about. And whereas, if you look at the next structure that is internal to that we have 4 threads. So, this is the thread id of x equal to 1 and uh, the corresponding y, the thread id of y equal to 0. So, what we have to understand? There is an x and y coordinate for the block and there is an x and y coordinate for the thread within the block. Now, if you see the row it is been defined by block id y into block dimension of y plus thread id of y. Whereas, column is defined as block id of x into block dimension of x into thread dimension of the x. So, rho equal to 1 into 2 plus 1 that is equal to 3 that is what I am telling column equal to 0 into 2 plus 1 this will take you into the 1. So, the image 3 1 will consist of this corresponding rho and column component image of 3 into 8 plus 1 and where it is belonging to the appropriate row and then column that is being defined. So, in short when you talk in one dimensional perspective accordingly the coordinates are there and when you talk about two dimensional perspective accordingly the coordinates has to be redefined. Now, let us come to certain case studies to start with let us take the most popular one that is from the NVIDIA series. There are lot of GPU architectures that have come out from NVIDIA. We learned some of the fundamental architectural features of these one and then we move into the next level. To start with let us talk about NVIDIA Tesla. It is a streaming processor array that you are talk about. It consists of multiple TPCs and then you have this SMs and then internally you have the streaming processors that has been available. So, this is typically your Tesla architecture multiple TPCs are there and each TPC consists of multiple SMs that we already discussed and each SM has an instruction cache, instruction fetch or dispatch, register file and then you have multiple streaming processors organized as, as multiple lanes. So, we have your shared memory that has been there and inside the processors we have the same kind of shared memory that is available for the threads to work on. So, you have some constant memory and then you have the shared memory. The next version from NVIDIA was about NVIDIA Fermi. So, in the Fermi architecture we have streaming multiprocessors already we have learned SM streaming multiprocessors and that consists of streaming processors inside that that is the SPs and then you have the blocks are divided into warps and you have SIMD units which will be taking care of 
32 threads that are there. So, here also we can see that the instruction cache is there, something that is going to take care of uh, the warp scheduling and the dispatching, load store units are there, functional units are there, streaming functional units are there and wherever constant memory and shared memory architecture that is there, this also will be taken care of. Now, if you look into that, see how block 0 warps and block 1 warps like that. The previous uh, lecture, we already discussed about what are warps and how are they going to interact. The set of all activities that is happening under one clock cycle is defined under one warp like that. This is been going to be applied with the same fashion across the architecture that we are discussing. Similarly, there are a lot of GPU architectures that are being proposed from the NVIDIA. So, if I just compile it across, we have streaming multiprocessors or it is also known as compute units and within that we have SIMD pipelines and then we have streaming processors which is also known as the CUDA cores which has various vector lines. So, this is the two level of hierarchy that we propose and if you look into the number of streaming processors into the number of streaming multiprocessors into the number of streaming processors across generations for NVIDIA Tesla proposed in 2007, we have 30 streaming multiprocessors and each of them are having 8 streaming processors. So, the Fermi architecture, this number gets changed to 16 by 32. In Kepler, it has gone to 15 into 192. In Maxwell architecture, it is 24 by 128. In Pascal architecture, we have 56 into 64. And in the Volta architecture, it is going. And there are a few more that has happened after 2017, which I am not listing here. So, anyway, this shows that over the years, in terms of the number of streaming multiprocessors, increased as well as the number of streaming processors or CUDA cores inside each compute unit also has massively increased. So, if you look at this, we have learned upon a sequence of things, a sequence of architectures and what are the kind of enhancement that is been proposed in terms of the number of compute engines and the number of CUDA cores that is been available. Let us now look into a different context of the same GPUs. We look for uh, performance parameters. What are the important criteria by which we assess the performance of a GPU or can we use some optimization techniques by which the performance of a GPU can be enhanced or not. Let us look into basically three things from the memory access point of view because GPU involves a lot of accessing this memory. Is it really possible to hide the latency through some technique? So, that is about latency hiding and uh, we will learn about memory coalescing technique and then we try to see whether any kind of data reuse is possible. So, all these three is high is basically used to improve the performance of GPU. Then we look into certain utilization aspect. We will learn about a technique called divergence by which the SIMD utilization can be improved and then about a uh, since there are a lot of transfers that happen from the CPU side to GPU side, how these transfers uh, can be done in a more efficient way such that performance is not being hampered with. Let us now try to understand from a latency hiding point of view. Think of a case you have four active warps and your warp 0 is taking care of one instruction, let us say instruction 3 and your warp 1 is currently handling with instruction 2 and then your warp 0 is going to, since warp 0 is already over, it is going to handle with a long latency inst instruction. Meanwhile, warp 2 is coming, it is taking care of some other instruction and warp 3. So, you have warp 0, 1 and then 2 and 3 at the meantime is taking care of some other instruction and then you continue. So, what you are seeing here is when you have 4 warps available, 0, 1, 2 and 3, even if warp 0 is handling a long latency instruction, at the same time warp 2, warp 2 and 3 can take care of the other instruction. So, that the longer latency of warp 0 is hidden with, with uh, the execution of warp 2 and warp 3. We have 4 active warps. Let us now try to consider this from another scenario where you have only 2 active warps. Let us say warp 0 is trying to run instruction 3 in the same case and your warp 1 same as the previous case and then we have a long latency instruction wherein warp 0 is been running. So, as and when warp 1 is over, warp 1 will run instruction 3. But then you cannot have your warp 0 running the next instruction because you have to wait this one is long. So, in this way the, the extra latency or the longer latency that is been incurred by instruction 4 cannot be completely hidden. This is the space 
at which nothing can be possible. So, you have only 4 warps that is been available. So, what we have to do is the fine grained multi threading can hide long latency task, especially memory access can be hidden if you have better occupancy that is the ratio of active warps. But if you look into how many active warps are there, there are a lot of parameters that are going to play a crucial role by which I can determine as a designer how many would should be the occupancy ratio, the ratio of active warps. So, some of the important parameters if you look one by one, the first one is going to be the maximum number of warps per SM streaming multiprocessor. Then the second one is maximum number of blocks per SM. So, these are the typical standard numbers what we have in the latest GPUs. Now, each of the thread may have to use some register. So, how much of register usage is possible and how much of the shared memory usage is possible. So, these are the typical numbers that we have in the modern day. When it comes to the number of threads per block, it has been defined from the programmer through the compiler and the registers per thread that is also like if you write a good program or if a compiler can do a good optimization, then I can reduce the number of registers or I can pack in more number of registers such that the registers can be used in a more efficient way. And then uh, the shared memory per block also, this is also defined from the programmer through the compiler. So, there are a lot of factors that has been determined based upon how efficient your compiler can help you in this cause. So, obviously, the number of warps per SM, blocks per SM, register usage, shared memory usage as well as the number of threads, the shared memory block and the registers per thread, all these are going to play a significant role in determining what is going to be your occupancy ratio and based upon what you have seen, your occupancy ratio, the number of warps that you can have will have a significant impact on how much you can hide the latency. So, more warps will be able to hide the latency, but if you are going for more number of warps, then it is based upon many other parameter including the register and the shared memory capacity. So, from the designer point of view, I have to optimize these divergent parameter to make the best use out of it. Now, let us talk about another technique known as memory coalescing. When accessing your global memory, you have to bring some data from the global memory into your corresponding thread or the kind of block that you are talking into the block and the block have a shared memory. So, you are going to bring a chunk of data and put it in your shared memory space wherein the threads of the same block can access. So, when you access global memory, if the concurrent threads access the nearby location, it is going to improve bandwidth. So, you have a block of data and then you have your shared memory, you are going to bring in something and putting in the shared memory, thread 1, thread 2, thread 3, thread 4, like the different threads are there. Now, these are concurrent threads because they are going to work together. So, if concurrent threads access nearby location, it improve bandwidth utilization. Nearby location means nearby location in memory. You know that in cache memory, we are going to learn more about cache memory in the subsequent modules. You have to understand that you bring a line of data, we call it as a block of data from, from your main memory into the cache. It is not only one word, it consists of multiple words. Now, if your threads are going to act, if the concurrent threads are going to act on the same block, then I get better utilization. If thread 1 is going to act on this block, thread 2 is going to act on the next block, thread 3 on the third block, then more amount of cache memory is going to be used for running the front threads. Let us try to see with the help of an example. So, look at the case that this is going to be your array called MD, wherein your thread 1 is going to operate your data in this way. So, this is your uh, total uh, uh, data that has been kept in memory. Let us say if this much is part of one cache line, this is cache line 2, cache line 3 like that. Let us say this consists of 4 cache lines when you are going to bring. So, this is what whatever you see in blue color is a content in memory and your thread 1 is going to work. Now, what you see is your thread 2 is going to work with uh, a different one. Let us mark with the thread 2 like this. So, this is your thread 2, these are the cache lines. So, if you have a thread 1 and a thread 2 that is going to work with a different cache lines, then we may not be able to get that kind of a efficiency. Whereas, consider the case like that. So, you have uh, your cache lines like this, let us say I will put up this third one and fourth one. So, in this case, this thread, both the thread T1 and T2 are going to access the content of a same cache line. 
So, with just one line available in the cache, both the threads can be satisfied. Here in this case, what I have to do is, let us say if there are n threads that is available, n cache lines are actively being uh, chased and accessed in order to work with this. Let us now look into this with a better kind of a representation. Consider a data that is available, which is uh, maybe a matrix format and think of a case that you have four rows that is going to be there. Now, if I am going to access your thread in this direction, access direction in the kernel of the code, this is the way how a row major format representation of the same matrix, where the yellow represent one row and the red next row, the blue third row and the green is the last row. Now, I am going to access in this way. So, my first thread is like this T1, T2, T3 and T4. If this is the way that has been there, the first element T1 is going to work with. Thread 2 is going to work with the first element of the next row. Thread 3 is working with the. So, if T1, T2, T3, T4 are going to be concurrently running, then you require the presence of these four lines inside the cache that is going to stress your cache. Now, if you look into T1's next axis, that is this is happening in time period 1, in time period 2, T1 go to the next element, T2 go to the next element in this cache line and that is the way how it is going to be utilized. This is not going to give us best performance. So, let us try to understand what we did. We have concurrent threads and we, if we are allowing concurrent threads to access multiple cache lines as and when the execution proceeds there is you are going to have accesses to various cache lines. So, that much amount of your cache memory is being reserved in order to pump in data for this concurrent threads. Let us now look into the other model. Now, think of a case your access direction is in this term. So, your T1, T2 will be like this. So, in the same fashion if you are going, your T1 is going to work with M0, T2 is going to operate on M1 and like that. If this is the way that is going to access in time period 1. Whereas, in time period 2, so once during time period 1, even if all 4 threads are there in this block, just all these 4 threads are restricting their access to one cache line. So, once that is over, you bring the next cache line and all of them operate on it. So, in the previous case for 4 threads to 1, 4 cache lines are exclusively utilized. Whereas, in this case, when you coalesce the memory with only one cache line, four of the threads can work. So, this is the beauty of when you perform this coalesced memory, that is the way that is going to be. So, when you write, so this is basically what it is telling, when the GPU code runs, if these kind of optimizations are being done on the code by understanding the underlying hardware. So, here the cache memory concept comes into picture and the GPU threads are going to access in such a way that it is cache line friendly. This is called coalescing the memory or understanding the cache line architecture and accordingly the thread, which thread will access what data parameter that is going to help us. Now, let us look into the choice of data structures used. Let us consider two cases. I hope you are familiar with the concept of array of structures and the structure of arrays. So, the structure of array means you have various array. Let us say array A, B, C and D. Four arrays are there, three of them are float and the last one is going to be integer and then you are going to make a structure using all these. Since your A is the first one, you have eight consecutive locations which will represent A, next eight consecutive location will represent B, then C and then D. This is the way how it looks in memory. The alternate design choices, you have an array of structures. So, first you define a structure which consists of A, B, C and D. So, these four represents your one structure and then you are going to make an array of it. So, that is the way how you can see that. So, the color represents this one. So, this is A in this case, here the value of A is being spread across different location. Now, in this case, if you are going to operate, then what you are going to get is your first thread. In, in this case, your T1 is going to operate on iteration number 0. So, this is your T1 that is here, T2 is going to be working on iteration number 1. So, in this case, you are all the threads can be restricted to this cache line. In memory, they are continuously located. Your T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7 and T8, their access is more or less to the same block. Once it is been over, you go to the next line. In this case, what happened? Your T1 works in this, your T2 is going to work in this, T3 here, T4, T5, T6, T7 and T8. That is the way how it works. After that, I move into the next one. 
So, in this way here and structure of arrays is going to be a better data structure than array of structures when we are trying to run this particular code in a GPU framework. So, this is called a stride what you are talking. So, stride means how far is two adjacent threads accessing. So, in this case let us say the adjacent threads are accessing after a stride of 4. This T1 is here and uh, whatever location T1 is accessing with that you add 4 then only you will get to know the location in which T2 is accessing. So, lower the stride you are going to have better memory bandwidth utilization. So, this is the graph that has been showing as you increase the stride size you can see that there is a sudden degradation of the throughput. So, this design will give you better throughput whereas, this will not give you because it is having a larger stride. In this case your stride is going to be 1 in the upper diagram whereas, here it does the stride is going to be 4. If you increase the stride to even more throughput still further come down. Now, let us look into another concept known as data reuse especially in many of the artificial intelligence and machine learning application where we work with huge arrays we may use with some concept called a mask or a filter. It is a small kind of a matrix that move around your actual data. Let us say your actual data is there and on top of that there is a sliding matrix which will do some kind of an operation. So, this mask will slowly move from one end to another. So, the data of the mask sometimes you may have to reuse. Let us now try to introduce this concept of how data reuse can help. So, look at the case that you are going to perform some operation let us say this is an operation I am going to talk about a mask. So, in this case there is a 3 by 3 matrix that is going to perform some operation. Now, the value that you are going to get the sum is going to be across the loop. So, the value that is stored in all these 9 locations which are nothing but the neighbor of this pixel they are being used the values in all the neighboring locations are being used in order to compute a value of sum. This equation tells that. So, what you have to do is you have a moving matrix that matrix value is being multiplied by the neighbors value in order to get this. Now, in this case I have the data that is been available. Now, if you lose this we are going to talk about a concept called tiling. So, divide the input into tiles that can be loaded into the shared memory. So, think of a case that here I am going to bring this much of data which is a huge data. Now, what happens is inside this data we have to take only 9 of the data to process. So, these 9 data are going to be used for this cell. Similarly, if I take it up then these 9 data. So, these 9 data are going to be used for this that comes in the center of that. Let me take up another combination such that the value would be even more clearer to all of us. These 9 data are going to be for this and these 9 data are going to be used for this cell. So, if you look at this for the center 4 cells these are the data out of which this is a common point. This much of data is being used by all these 4 squares. So, if this data is already available then the operation that can be done with 4 of these crossed marked pixels can be completely done with a larger tile. We have a 4 by 4 tile here. If you bring this 4 by 4 tile and then you rearrange the code in such a way that you could actually access rather than see the normal way of accessing is I compute this then I go for this then I go for this. This is the order in which you compute rather than that order if you can focus our attention to this 4 that means with already brought in value the sum of these 4 pixels can be calculated. So, what you do you divide the input into tiles that can be loaded into the shared memory. Now, since the data is already there in shared memory, I am trying to reuse this data as much as you can. Now, let us look into another aspect which is known as the bank conflict. Typically in GPUs, they use this shared memory whatever they are having, it is multi bank. Multi bank means they are physically stored in different different layers. So, each of the thread are going to access different banks then it is going to be easy. 
So, look at this structure when you have 16 threads and if let us imagine that the shared memory is organized in terms of 16 banks and if there is exists a linear addressing stride then thread 0 would be always accessing data from bank 1, thread 1 would be always accessing data from bank 2. In this way there is no conflict at all whenever a thread wanted to access a data it is directly going to access a bank where nobody else is accessing. Now, even if you do a random allotment, but if it is still one to one, every thread has a unique bank that has been mapped, here also there is no conflict that is going to be there. Now, let us look into this example, where you have a two way bank conflict, you, you have a stride of two. So, now you can see that thread 8 as well as thread 0 are mapped to bank 1. So, when thread 0 try to access a data, at the same time when thread 8 is going to access a data, they both are being directed to bank 0 in order to take. Similarly, thread 1 and thread 9 for example, they are mapped to bank 2. So, both of them will try to reach out to bank 2 in order to get the data which can create some delay, both cannot access it together. Similarly, you can have an 8 way bank conflict also. Think of a case many of them let us say 8 banks are mapped into bank 0 another 8 banks are mapped into bank 8. In this way also if it is done, then it is going to increase bank conflicts. So, how can you reduce bank conflict? That is what we are going to say. So, there is a technique known as padding. So, bank conflicts are possible typically only within a warp. No bank conflicts are there between wraps, but within a warp then you have multiple threads available. So, how do you make use of it? So, consider the case you wanted to access an array and with the help of the thread id that I am going to access. So, this means that 2 into thread id. So, consider the case that you have 8 threads that are going to be there. So, this is thread 0, the content of 0th location is taken by thread 0, this is thread 1, thread 2, thread 2 will take it from location 4 or maybe in this case bank 4, thread 3 will take from bank 6, then thread 4 will take it from bank 8. Since you do not have a bank 8, this is mapped to bank 0. So, what you see here is there are total of 8 banks available 0 to 7 and you are going to access a data. So, in this case you can see that thread 4 is going to access from bank 0. So, you can see that thread 0 as well as thread 4 they are trying to take from the same bank. Okay. So, thread 0 as well as thread 4 are mapped into bank 0. Now, if you look into thread 1 and thread 2 are going to be accessing from bank 2. That is the way how it. So, this is a conflict, they cannot access it. Now, what we can do is we can introduce some technique known as padding. So, in this case, what happens is your thread 4 is now accessing bank 1. So, once you induce a forced padding, that means in certain locations inside your memory, we are not going to store any data. This means that thread 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 can be mapped to 8 different banks if this is going to be your mapping. This is a special case wherein I am going for a stride of 2. So, when I have a stride of 2 then it is possible that in the conventional way 2 threads can create a problem in this and these banks are not at all used at all. You can see that never these banks would be used. So, even though I have banks. So, in this case I am forcefully padding. Padding means to add 0 values. So, padding can optimize even if you use a stride of 2. So, what padding does is to understand in what is going to be the stride and based upon the stride can I reorganize the access such that there will not be any bank level conflict that happens. So, initially we learned about how can you hide the latency. Latency hiding can be done if you have more active threads that is been there, the ratio of the active threads and then we learned about the coalescing technique wherein understanding the cache memory organization, how the threat movement is going to happen and now we are going, we already learned about the reuse technique. Now, let us look into the SIMD utilization. Think of a case uh, of a scenario where all the even threads are going to do certain operation. So, first you perform some operation, then only the even threads will perform the this operation, whereas the odd threads will perform that operation. So, it is based upon an if. So, first all the threads will perform a computation, 
then I am going to do an if operation where all the even threads will do and the odd threads will perform only the else operation. But inside a ramp that if you are looking for a warp, you have threads T0, T1, T2 and T3 which consists of even threads as well as odd threads. So, inside your ramp, you have half 50 percent of your threads inside your warp are active for some time, the other 50 percent is active only after some time. So, this is not going to be an efficient one because 50 percent of the threads inside your warp are underutilized. So, how do you do that? It is called a divergence free execution. What you do rather than the splitting in terms of odd and even threads, now you tell that first 32 threads ranging from 0 to 31, they will perform this operation. The next 32 threads which has been defined by this will perform the second operation. That is the if would be done only by the first 32 threads, the, the else portion would be done by the next 32 threads. So, in this case what happen is these are all active, in this case this is active whereas this portion is not active. Now, if you look into these are my threads, all these threads inside my warp in this case let us say this is my particular warp which consists of 8 threads all of them are active next 8 they are also active. Whereas, in this case in for that particular warp all the 8 threads are null. So, that I can turn it off if you want. So, in this way I make sure that either my warp is 100 percent busy or it is 100 percent idle there is not a case of where 50 percent is going to be the utilization. Accordingly, fine grained power gating can be applied if this is going to be the scenario. Power gating means temporarily turning it off. So, this is called divergence free execution. Now, let us look into yet another aspect it is called the vector reduction. Suppose, if you do a name mapping and then think of a case that you have these data elements and now I am going to use threads on these data elements. Let us say we have a stride of 2. Now, let us say I am going to perform a sum operation. So, the what I am doing is I am trying to add the contents, trying to add the contents of these two. The next two elements I am going to add. So, your thread number 2 will add 2 and 3, thread number 4 will add 4 and 5, 6 and 7 is done. So, you will be able to get the pattern. So, this is your iteration 1. Now, what happens is in your iteration 2, this is going to be idle. So, your iteration 2 this is idle, this is idle whereas, this is idle and when it comes to iteration 3 these are all idle. So, this is active and this is active. So, if multiple threads are being pulled together to form a warp I can see that once you complete one more iteration level 50 percent of your threads are going to be in the idle stage. So, the thread utilization inside your warp will come down because what you see here is for the first iteration I want all the threads. So, in this case all the threads are running. When it comes to the next iteration out of those threads that are running in this level only half of them will be running in the next level. So, my thread utilization will come down accordingly the warp utilization also is less. When I go for one more level then I so in this case what I can see that I have 4 active threads here I have only 2 active threads, here I have only 1 active thread, but they will see that in this way the number of elements are that are going to come down. Now, how can you handle this? All active threads belong to the same warp that is the idea. So, we know that in the previous case we are trying to take a sum whether the sum you do between 0 plus 1 and then 2 plus 3 and then like that we know that as per the algorithm as per the property if we add 0 and 16 also that is perfectly fine. Ultimately, we are going to sum up all. So, when you use a GPU in order to perform your sum rather than adjacent addition, we can do some kind of a rearrangement. Look at say how it is being done. I have total of 16 threads like what you can see that the way how it is being done. So, what I do is 0 and 16 I am going to add. Now, this one is going to add 1 and 15. So, 1 and 17 would be added, 2 and 18. 3 and 19 like that you are going to add. So, in this case after the first iteration this many threads are going to be idle they may be part of one warp. So, the warp is completely going to be idle in this case it is not like 50 percent utilization. 
whereas you have activity that is happening in this much area there is high utilization of all the threads. Now, when you do in the next level your activity get concentrated to here whereas, this also get freed up and one more level that you go your activity gets. So, at every stage you are having few set of wraps that is going to be completely going to be idle and that keeps on increasing at every iteration. So, we may start with something like 32 warps that is available after the first iteration you can see in that 16 warps are only required the other warps can retire the threads can retire it come down to 8 4 1. In this case also ultimately I will get the sum here down, but the way in which I compute sum it gives us better utilization this is called divergence free mapping. Now, we come to the last component of our performance trade off in this what we are trying to explore here is you have to move your data from the CPU to GPU. So, you move the data GPU is going to perform some operation and then you take the result back. How much you have to move? This is yet another parameter. Can I completely move and ask the GPU to start or can I be done in a pipeline way? As we have already learned about instruction pipeline techniques, maybe those techniques can be customized here in order to get a better understanding of this. So, let us try to do the sequence of operation that are performed are CPU, GPU data transfer, the kernel execution and then from the GPU back to CPU data transfer. So, one is CPU to GPU and other one is GPU back to the CPU. So, think of a case the default stream of execution is you copy your data that much time it will take the transfer time and then you are going to execute the task. So, this is the typical way in which uh, a default stream works. So, until this point the GPU engine is waiting for the data it is waiting for the transfer to get over and once the transfer is over now the bus is free. Can I make use of it in a better way say in an asynchronous transfer what you do your computation is divided into n streams. So, this is the typical one that we had initially I am going to divide your green which is your copy copy operation into multiple chunks. Now, once this chunk reaches the GPU the execution can start at the time the next data copying happens. So, if you particularly look here you are copying the data at the same time the execution. So, copying happens between the CPU to GPU and at the same time execution happens in the GPU. So, wherever vertically if you look if the green color is there that means copying is in process. If the brown color is there that means execution is in process. Since you can see both of them under one vertical line both copying of data and execution of data happens. So, copying and execution happens in a pipeline fashion. Now, the question is what is the relative value of this transfer time as well as the execution time which is bigger is this bigger or the other one bigger or how much relatively the bigger is. So, if your execution time is going to be highly dominant over the transfer time we call it as a dominant kernel lot many things have to be done on the kernel then what happen is T is going to be there plus T T plus n streams that is going to be the dominant kernel that is there whereas, in this case what happen is you have your transfer time is dominant over this. So, in this case what I am going to do is the analysis that you give you the rough estimate which is going to be the dominant one. So, whom am I going to divide that is the way how it is going to be the case. Now, overlap in communication and computation. So, application with independent computation on different data instances can benefit from asynchronous transfer. For example, consider the case of a video transfer. So, here I have a sequence of 6 frames that are been transferred from CPU to GPU and then you are going to perform this computation that is called this is computation that is been happening. Now, what you can do this is called a non streamed execution in a streamed execution a chunk of 2 frames is transferred to the device and then 2 by B blocks compute on the chunk at the same time the second chunk is being processed. So, vertically if you look there is execution that happens and there is transfer that happens. In this way if you do this is the amount of saving that you get this is already a published work in journal of parallel and distributed computing. So, what we are learning is some advanced architecture principles wherein rather than conventional non streamed execution can I have a streamed execution where I pipeline the concept where transfer from CPU to GPU as well as execution in GPU happens parallelly. 
So, before summarizing what about performance consideration, we learned about techniques by we can hide memory latency by having more wars that are been there. The coalescing technique also was helping to make use of cache lines that are already been available. And in the third case, we used about reuse mechanism principles. And this reuse mechanism principle also has been very useful whenever we wanted to compute a data, whatever data is already that has been brought into in the tiled fashion, try to reuse it as much as possible. Then we have seen divergence free execution with the if then else case, wherein the utilization of all the threads we are trying to maximize. So, to avoid warps with certain threads active and certain threads passive or certain threads retiring, we can use that. And then we have seen the mapping in the reduction wherein a huge array need to be processed. How we make sure that at every stage rather than having multiple warps that you keep and having less utilization inside a warp, we can reduce the number of warps that you are using at each table such that at the end the reduction then applies. Towards the end we learned about in what way optimizations need to be done wherein communication as well as computation inside a GPU can be parallelly overlapped to improve performance and to get better throughput. So, we have now initially we start in the previous lecture with what is GPU, its features, the vectorization, the background and coming up to some case studies, some architectural optimizations that can be done. With this, we come to the end of the GPU sections and we will work out few numerical designs in the next video. Thank you.